So, our speaker today is no stranger to Sakpa. She thinks she can still count the number of times she's talked to us on one hand, but it's getting close. It might be more than one hand. Dr. Melanie Thomas, professor of the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary, and she will speak on balancing competing, in quotes, I'm sure she'll explain, interests, how Albertans think about energy transition. All yours, Melanie. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. It's always nice to be back in Lethbridge. I'm a proud alum of the U of L. Uh, it's always nice to see so many familiar faces as well when I when I come. And so, um, this particular project is a bit of a shift um, for the university folks. This is what happens once you get tenure and you decide that you have to add something to your research agenda. That's quite different uh, than what you got tenure on. Um, this particular project, what's interesting about it for me is that. As far as we can tell, we are the first or amongst the first to actually ask regular folks what they think about energy transition. Uh, in the climate literature, uh, when I asked why haven't people looked at this, part of the argument that I got back from very senior scholars is, well, we don't want to build the opposition's case for them. And my approach is very much a, we, if we want to understand the issue, we have to understand how people react to the issue. And the spoiler alert, the way that Albertans think about this is quite different different than um, how government talks about it. So um, my colleagues that I have on this project, um, Brooks DeCilia, he's at Mount Royal, and Laura Thorlickson, she's at the University of Alberta. Okay. So one of our starting points is this idea that has come up in the climate change literature about what do we do about the climate change that we're seeing. And to quote um, these two uh, authors, Bernauer and McGrath, publishing in Nature, they say, in many, if not most countries, rapid progress towards a low carbon economy seems technically feasible, but politically impossible. I can tell you that I'm on any number of projects relating to um, energy transition, carbon dioxide removal. I spend a lot of time talking to engineers. And it's not that the technical issues are um, easy to solve, because they're not, but the, the kicker is this idea that there is a very strong disconnect between that technical way of talking about things and then the political context in which we would actually have to enact some of these changes. When we talk about low carbon economies, we talk about energy transition, and energy transition has a very simple definition. It's twofold. It's moving away from fossil fuels and moving towards more renewable sources of energy. One thing I would like folks to take away from this is that this is not a single spectrum where folks are on the fossil fuel end or the renewable end. These are two distinct things. The way that people think about these things is distinct. Uh, when we talk about energy transition this way, uh, about moving away from fossil fuels and towards more renewable sources of energy, it cues two existential threats. For folks paying attention to Alberta politics, this is not news. Um, the first existential threat is from climate change, and we have seen this. Um, every time we get the smoke from a forest fire, or um, it's not been minus 30 yet, which I find a bit disorienting, if I'm being honest as a prairie kid. Uh, it suggests that the climate is changing in ways that, and if you listen to the climate scientists talk about this, they, are, they, are, they don't know what to say anymore to try to get people to be motivated to care about that issue. Um, the second is a political issue. Uh, and it's a political issue that is uh, one that makes a lot of hay for what we call party families on the political right. So as a political scientist, when we talk about this, we don't want to, we want to generalize about political parties. So I'm not picking on any particular party family, but it's not lost in me that when we talk about this in Alberta, um, it's a, it's the UCP that talks about this in that kind of existential threat narrative. So this is from 2019, immediately following, or as part of the uh, 2019 election from April. This is in the Globe and Mail. This is the idea that Jason Kenney was campaigning in 2019 about Alberta being under siege. Uh, and the question is, but will voters buy it? And it's this one of these things where it's a, uh, 
He spent the campaign in much of the past three years creating the narrative of a province facing an existential threat under attack from many sides by forces who want to impede or destroy Alberta's oil sector. And if you think back to the Kenny government in 2019, especially following that election, there was this kind of like, you're either with us or you're not an Albertan idea. And it's kind of like, if you're with us, you do oil in a particular kind of way. Uh, this has been carried forward with, you know, variations on a theme by the current government of Alberta. This is from August 2023, and the one on um, the right here is from November 9th. And so we know that the current government of Alberta has instituted a renewables moratorium. One of the rationales that was for it was a cleanup issue, which anybody who's paid attention to the orphan well issue is just like, no. <laughs> Really? The number of times I, I laugh at the news and think, ah, oh, what a time. Um, that's not my research reaction to things, but it, like as a private citizen, I'm like, oh, wow, up is down. I don't know. Um, but this is the idea of like the existential threat to oil in Alberta is now being presented as we actually need to block renewable energy. Uh, because it is not what we think it is or it's not something that we want to engage in. So I don't know if anybody listened to the Premier on The Current this morning on CBC Radio. Uh, I caught part of it where I will say I, I, Daniel Smith is to me Schrodinger's politician where I'm not sure which version I'm going to get. So it, either she can be exceptionally savvy and skilled and also sometimes you get a completely conspiratorially thinking like it, thing that it doesn't seem very skilled at all, right? And in that current interview, there were instances where I'm just kind of like, ooh, that's a compelling bit of political messaging. And then it would pivot. And if you didn't have the knowledge on like the, the, the knowledge in the weeds about some issues, I could see how she would go, you, people might go with her um, to a conclusion that's absolutely not supported by the evidence. Um, and it has to do with very particular kinds of savvy messages messaging. All of it is very much, for both of them, is about the, the, Justin Trudeau is the enemy, and we just need to make sure that the federal government, and this idea that there seems to be this ceaseless well of um, anger towards the federal government, particularly this iteration of the federal government. I'm not sure, if we can talk about the political strategy if folks want to, uh, and how it makes sense in the context of Canadian federalism. I'm skeptical at the best of times, but suffice it to say, I think it's easy to demonstrate that the government of Alberta, the past two iterations of it, um, wants to say that energy transition is something that's bad for Alberta. It's something that's threatening for Alberta. It's something that we should not do. So the elite message can be reasonably interpreted as something like energy transition is an existential threat to Alberta because it is an existential threat to oil. Our question is how many Albertans actually think about it this way? So what I'm trying to do in this context is we're trying to describe what is or try to get our best estimate of what's actually happening. And then the next step would be, do we think that this is a good thing, the normative evaluation? So this is very much empirical. We're trying to actually get a description of what's happening. When we started this, we had a few clues. Uh, and this is work that's been done um, uh, by environmental uh, non-government organizationals or environmental nonprofits, where what they wanted to do with this particular project is they wanted to see if there were narratives or stories that could be told um, to Albertans that would make action on climate change resonate or make this kind of language land. Uh, and so when we first started this, one of the things that we found is that there wasn't a lot of work on energy transition. And so we started kind of like scabbering around to be like, is there something that we can use as a toehold to start doing this kind of work? One of the things that they found is that there are very few persuasive, generalizable, universal stories or narratives that you can talk to Albertans with um, about climate change or about energy transitions, as in people are complicated and they think different things. You can't tell the same story to everybody and expect it to work. That seems reasonable. Um, the most persuasive messages that they found were things like people are proud of Alberta and they feel gratitude, quote unquote, for being able to live in a place. And reading between the lines, I look at gratitude as there's money and that makes doing life here a bit easier than what it would be in, say, New Brunswick or something along those lines. So there's gratitude. 
climate change has a low profile. Um, folks who know farmers, if you talk about climate change, it doesn't, you don't get anywhere, but if ask them how the weather's changed and they won't stop talking about it. I can tell you, I know patterns about east winds and rain from my dad from when he first immigrated and I was like, oh, then I, I make hay off of that talking to other like urban folks being kind of like, don't ask a farmer about climate change, ask a farmer about changes in weather patterns and you will, they will be able to give it to you in detail, minute detail. Detail. So folk know, but they don't want to talk about it in terms of climate. They want to talk about it in terms of other contexts. There's a, an emotional defensive connection to oil and gas. And one of the things I can, I can tell you a generalization again about how regular folk interact with politics is that the emotions are the crux of it. And in talking to engineers, as soon as I mention this, they're just kind of like, that's not how it should be. And it's like, you don't get to tell people how they get to feel. Like, a, um, For me, people feel their feelings and they use them. And I think uh, it would be naive to think that it shouldn't be that way. I think it would be naive to think that it's not that way. And I think people have emotional reactions for reasons. And so understanding those emotional reactions is important. So there's this kind of like identity defensiveness um, that they noted in this work. And there's this idea that there's this enduring demand for oil that makes renewables a nice addition. So lots of folks, especially more corporate folks, would say, well, it's a good thing to have in the mix because um, they're lucrative. Folk do make a lot of money on them, but it isn't seen as the core. And if you heard the premier on the radio this morning, that's exactly what she said, where she's like, I can't bring in more solar or wind if I'm not allowed to build more natural gas to bridge it. And I was like, that's a testable proposition. I would like to see the data and the evidence for that. This was not on offer in the interview, but it rarely is on the radio, fair. Um, the other thing that's striking about this, because I wouldn't be comfortable doing my work if there wasn't an equity component that would help bring more justice in the world. Um, the equity stuff related to energy transition isn't the gender space that I live in with my other research. It's very much related to indigenous peoples and colonialism. And so one of the things that's striking about this project is that they tried sincerely to integrate indigenous folks into the process that they used. And the indigenous peoples were like, this isn't how we do it. Like, and there's, there's I, I will give them credit. They dutifully report um, very candid statements from indigenous peoples being like, this doesn't work for us and this is why. Uh, and then the report like moves on to be kind of like, here are the narrative that you can talk to Albertans with as if they didn't just document that they completely exclude, that, that indigenous voices were not included. Um, so there's this, this indigenous colonial part that is always the underpinning that I think is where the really sticky part of this stuff is. Okay, anyway, when they talk about transition here, it doesn't mean, for the settlers, it doesn't mean replace, it means being gradual. It seemed to be a neutral idea because at least when they were doing this work, transition uh, represented no real change to the status quo. Uh, our team, I'm gonna skip through some of these things really quickly because it's like the nerdy in the weeds. If people wanna talk about like why I'm very confident that we can make a causal claim, I have the receipts, but Others might not be interested in <laughs> some of those details and just get to the findings. Here's our basic like way that we understand how we want to understand this stuff. So this is very similar to how we establish how people vote. There's who people are, and this has an effect. Sometimes it's direct, sometimes it mediates through who you are, structures what you believe, your values. Those things structure how you perceive things like climate and energy. Those things affect whether or not you're watching the news and which news you choose to engage with, and that all feeds into directly, and it's this whole system into this. So we take all of this stuff into account. It's quite complicated. If somebody wanted to be like, yes, but I bet that there are causal arrows going in multiple directions, we acknowledge this. It's by definition has to be blunter um, in order for us to actually be able to make sense of the data and do our work. Okay, so the first study and the bulk of the data that I'm gonna be talking about here comes from April 2019. Well, okay, we have a bunch of questions. It's basically what do regular people think about this? I'll skip over that. And the other thing that we're asking is how, what do people think and can we change their minds? How malleable is it? Can we, can we shift them a bit? Uh, we 
for the first study, we were in the field immediately following the 2019 Alberta election. And so if somebody's saying that is before the pandemic, it is very old, I would say yes. Also, time means nothing and education broke. So <laughs> we are slower than what we would like to be with some of these things. We published uh, some stuff out of this. But I think it's important to look at this because as far as I can tell, this is the baseline about how Albertans think about this. Um, we have another data collection from 2020 where we're looking at, we replicate in Alberta and British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, we have reasons for why we picked that. I can go into that detail if folks have questions about this. But most of the stuff I'm going to be showing is from this 2019 study in just Alberta. We used vote compass data because actually finding a firm who can treat a province like a country, which is what we would want to do for the sampling, is hard um, because most firms in Canada don't need to do that. So we leveraged the CBC and the fact that lots of people would have done the vote compass during the election. We know that our sample is a bit younger because the vote compass is an online tool. Um, because CBC, I think the university crowd is more represented in these data as well. Uh, and people are more likely to report that they work in oil and gas. And I would say, I actually think that we're not, we've got like a quarter of our sample working in oil and gas compared to 13%, but that 13% that we have in like Alberta data comes from people who are actually working directly in extraction. So they don't count like the lawyer working for the corporate firm in downtown Calgary, that's an oil and gas firm. They wouldn't be counted in the official data as working in oil and gas, but folk understand it that way. So I actually don't think our 26% is all that off. Um, we do an experiment. I can go into the details if you'd like to do that. Okay. I do experimental stuff. Uh, when we talked about this, the thing that we wanted to see if we could get people to change their minds is to talk about how much money you could make in solar. Um, and also, I always confuse Hannah and Hinton, and I'm a bit horrified about this, but whichever one is the coal mining town, where the um, they were mining coal for electricity generation, and as we transitioned away from that, the town was kind of like, we kind of don't have like things to keep people around. Um, so that was the story that we had. Um, we've also got, uh, every time we replicate this, we don't need to change our stories. It's um, Indigenous folks want to buy into TMX, and Indigenous folks are protesting coastal gas link. We know that gas and bitumen are not the same thing, but when we talk about it, we just say pipeline, because we know that most people react to pipeline and not necessarily what's in it. Um, OK. Uh, and it works, like the, the study worked. OK, we asked about a bunch of things. We looked at a bunch of people. I'm conscious of the time. OK. Punchline. Almost 60%, 6 in 10, agreed that Alberta should move away from oil and gas. So many people agree that Alberta should move towards renewable sources of energy that I can't find many. It's a ceiling effect. It's 87%. So almost 9 in 10 think that we should be adding more renewables in. So immediately, things I like to do, and I like to teach it this way, which is kind of like when you find somebody who's from some other part of Canada that likes to say, you're from Alberta, neener, neener, I wouldn't be like, the elite narrative is not what public opinion says. The elite narrative is the elite narrative, and the elite narrative has its own goals. It is not public opinion. 70%, uh, we should restructure our economy to slow down the effects of climate change. 70% agreement. If you're asking, why is it possible that we have such a difference between the elite narrative and what people actually think, think about it for a minute. The last time that there was a government in Alberta that was truly responsive to what the public said that they wanted. I have lived here for a long time. I don't think I've ever seen that from a provincial government in Alberta. And uh, if I'm being totally candid, I don't think I saw it. I saw more of it, but not loads in other provinces. So again, there's this disconnect between what the, what the people in positions who are empowered by, say, election results and political institutions, what they want, um, compared to what regular folk want. Okay, uh, this is hard to see. Um, 
one of the things that's very clear is that people like these aren't like yes no questions people have strength of opinion so sometimes people feel really strongly about something and sometimes people don't feel very strongly about this and so this is we're looking at this being like depending on how strongly people feel about things these are the sorts of things that drive down support and so the there's three things here um, how people feel about the economy people's ideological identification, and whether or not they think oil and gas is going to be the most important industry in Alberta by 2050. So you can see that oil and gas hope stuff is what's actually the thing that makes people on balance opposed, which makes the elite strategy savvy. Right? They're, they're hitting on the people who are the most committed to this idea that by 2050, oil and gas is still going to be Alberta's most important industry. What I want to draw your attention to, and I don't know if you can see it at the back, is there's a little dotted horizontal line kind of in the middle of the figure. Um, that's the break-even point. So everything above that is supportive of energy transition. You have to be below that line to actually oppose it. And the further you are above it, the stronger the support. The further you are below it, the stronger the opposition. Um, even those people with like, the strongest hope in oil and gas, about 40% of them support energy transition. Uh, even the most staunch stalwart, um, like it should be the most raging form of market capitalism you've ever seen. Uh, those folks are still supportive of energy transition. Um, even the most radical people who identify as like a 10 on a zero to 10 scale where 10 is as far right as you can get, they're still above the line. They're still above the line. When we look at things that um, make people uh, more supportive, like I said, so many people support energy transition, particularly renewables, that it's hard to find things that can actually make it go higher because there isn't a whole lot of room to go. I can tell you it's not whether or not people believe climate change is caused by people, it's how worried they are about it. Lots of people believe that it's human caused, but they're not fussed. So the more concerned somebody is about uh, climate change, if it's something that actually keeps them up at night, they're going to be much more likely to say, we need to get the show on the road. Other work that I've done with environmental, as like an academic advisor to um, a group of ENGOs, they did a different kind of study with this, where they wanted to see how this all fit together in terms of, so what should we do about it? And that's where they can find like a substantive polarization, where there's some folks that are like, we need to get on, we need to get on it, we need to act on it and we want it done now. So if you're listening to the federal government and wondering who, like, who are they responding to in terms of like regular people, it's because there are a bunch of people who are like, this needs to be done before 2030. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, the other batch of folks is like, we're going to go as slow as possible, and to quote the premier again on the radio this morning, because I, India is not doing anything until 2075, and neither is China. So let's just go super slow. And when I say polarization, I don't mean the kind of emotional polarization, which is what we usually talk about. I mean people people actually profoundly disagree, and they take polar positions. So there isn't a lot in between, and the people who are in each camp, they're not talking to each other, and if they are, they're not persuading each other to take different views. Okay, other things that we found out. Um, Albertans really, really wanted to see emissions from oil and gas reduced by 2030, and they want them pretty much done by 2050. Uh, and also hearing news about um, indigenous opposition to a pipeline, so that would be coastal gas link, that actually, that hearing that news story made people want to reduce those emissions even more. And so I don't think that it's reasonable to say that um, people... Yeah, I mean, people have thoughts about this. People aren't dumb. They have ideas about this, and they, they're connecting some of these dots. Okay. Um, hearing about how much money you can make in solar made people want more solar and their electricity generation. Anyway, what does this all mean? Okay. If you had one takeaway from all of this, uh, I haven't shown all the work, but I can, if you trust me, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, worrying about climate change and how people think and feel about the climate, that matters for energy transition, but what really explains it are core political things. How people feel about the economy. Uh, Anti-indigenous racism. Partisanship and like regional alienation is in it, but what's really driving it is these ideas about the economy and racism. 
Um, one of the things, oh, and there, yeah, we can talk about that as well. Uh, to get at this colonial stuff, um, it, this is really basically going to John Locke, and I know I'm out of time, and I'm not going to do it service, but the question I would ask are, what are the things that are in our system that nobody ever questions, right? Nobody ever questions that the GDP always has to go up. Nobody ever questions, like, the, the, the sacred bits of our system are things related to the economy. Um, and this is why when you have indigenous protests, you have federal leaders, in this case, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, telling indigenous protesters who are not privileged by any means to check their privilege because how dare we slow or delay rail transport. Things that we can find is that um, anti-indigenous resentment pushes down support for energy transition. This is from the Canada-wide stuff. Uh, it pushes down support for energy transition as much as, in a similar kind of way, as how people feel about the economy. And how people feel about the economy is one of the strongest predictors of anti-Indigenous racism. For me, the best way to understand this is that this is John Locke talking about why it was OK to disappropriate and dis take away land from Indigenous peoples in North America, but why it wasn't OK to do it in England. He makes a really inconsistent argument. Lots of scholars have looked at this. Um, it's not my wheelhouse, but that's the only way I can make sense of these data. This is one of these reasons why Glenn Coulthard, um, writing in red skin, white masks, and this is the idea of like, who gets to be angry about this stuff? Is it Andrew Shear, or is it indigenous folks? At one point at the end of the book, he basically says, for indigenous nations to live, capitalism must die. And so the thing, the core where we're struggling with this, with this particular project now, is what this does with the stuff where people don't want to talk about changing the economy. We, do wanna, we want to talk about justice, we want to talk about indigenous reconciliation, but we, we also have to tell the truth about some of these things. And the th truth about energy transition is that racism matters quite a lot, and the thing that drives how people think about energy transition and also how hostile they are to indigenous folks is how they think about the economy. It's this, these kind of basic core economic ideas. Okay, uh, I have other things that I can say. Um, I'd also say regional alien, it, they're, they're loud, but they're small. Like, and so if you're wondering why you see all of these, like, why does the premier talk the way that they do? Loud, small, donate. If you keep them mad, you can keep them donating and volunteering. That's the political strategy there. Anyway. Ah, uh, I am, I think, just on time. And so thank you for going through the whirlwind with me. I'm happy to take your questions um, if you have them. Thank you. Next week's topic will be two speakers, Lynette uh, Solden and Bonnie Millward from uh, Rowan House. The topic will be working together to prevent domestic violence and abuse. Now for the Q&A, follow the good example here. Line up along the uh, wall, state your name clearly, it will be recorded, and try to keep your question brief. No long preludes or stories, please. We encourage and expect a respectful and polite discourse. If you're shy to come to the mic, write down your question legibly, sign it with your name and pass it to me and I will read your question. And uh, with that, we will start with the first questioner. Can I? I yes. I just want to hop in very quickly and say thank you to Bevan Henning for moderating and also to Canood for making the slides so easy. I always, like, I can tell all the stories about how the slides don't work, and so when they, are, they were just here, I was like, this is amazing. I wish that happened more often. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, my name is Maureen Hawkins. Um, I've got a ton of questions, Melanie, but yeah. first, I want, to, I want to ask you to clarify something. You were talking about uh, racism and... Do I understand correctly that those who are pro-oil and gas are anti-indigenous? Or am I misunderstanding? You kept saying they go along, but yeah. I didn't understand how. Okay, uh, this is a good question. So um, when I talk about the market conservatism, colonial capitalism stuff, the way that we measure that, 
uh, are with a series of questions. Um, in the early iterations of the project, we had four questions where asking people to agree if the economy was more important than the environment or vice versa. We, we took that one out because we think that it's um, too commingled with the thing that we're trying to explain. And so what we measure are like when business makes lots of money, every bene everybody benefits, including the poor. Um, government should leave it to business to create jobs. So the more forcefully people agree with that, the more racist they are towards Indigenous people. Yes. And this is why I, I go, I, when we initially saw um, the economy doing that work, it was before we really, the first cut, we didn't look at the, um, the colonialism Indigenous stuff. That was, it was, I remember it in 2019, where there's just so much here because nobody's done a lot of this work yet that we were like, what's going on? And it's been our evolution in looking at the, okay, so we're gonna look at the anti-Indigenous racism and seeing that the those economy ideas, literally when business makes a lot of money, everybody benefits, including the poor, and government should stay at a job creation. Those kinds of ideas are the strongest predictor Okay. Uh, and so this is, and so I don't know how else you would explain it without going to those ideas, right? Does that, does that idea go with transition or stay with oil and gas? Stay with oil and gas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was just trying to make clear. Yeah. Okay. Could I ask the question? Uh, maybe later, if there, oh. if there's time. Absolutely. <laughs> I feel like. See all the line up, okay? okay. Yeah, Ken Sears. Um, what I want to ask you about is move away from indigenous racism. I want to talk about, ask you about, there's a split in this culture, in this society between rural and urban. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strong split. And the thing, this is a bit, it's anecdotal, but I will stand by this. I speak to ranchers, farmers, uh, municipal officials, really municipal officials over the last decades. There is a deep-seated, unspoken resentment that I perceive that, I, that I'm picking up on between farmers and ranchers and oil companies because the oil companies have the ability to come in onto their land, do whatever they damn well want with it, and walk away and leave the mess. Nobody's talking about this, and I want to know what your perception of it and how it could possibly play out within the governing party of the province. Uh, yeah, so we have it. Um, this is where when we talk about sociodemographics to values and beliefs to the closer we get to the thing that we actually want to explain. So if you look at that, we have rural urban in there um, and it's compared to suburban. So we actually don't compare just like country folk to urban core. We know that there's stuff in between. Um, Rural and suburban, so urban is the, the urban core is the reference category there. Um, it looks like rural folk are more opposed, like they're significantly opposed to energy transition, but you'll notice that it goes from a dark dot in the first model to a gray dot for everything else, and that's because the reason why comes in that first, that second stage. It's partisanship. So I have other data um, looking at um, how rural Albertans, basically how much work is region doing. And the one thing that's striking when I look at rural folks, it's not that the values and beliefs are that different. Um, we can't find good evidence for that. What we can find, though, is that the effect of their partisan identity, particularly if they identify with the UCP, is overwhelming. That's doing all of the work. And I remember publishing this for the CBC, because it was part of um, uh, the CBC's Road Ahead project for CBC Calgary, uh, leading into the 2019 um, provincial election. And some rural folk read that piece and thought that I was saying that they were just dumb, and that's not it. Um, but partisanship is one of these things where we, some people want to say that it's a shortcut, and it, it's not. What it is is it's perceptual lens. Everybody has perceptual lenses, so like even if people aren't partisan, that is a perceptual lens that they use to interpret the political world around them. And so the strength of part, and partisanship isn't deterministic either. So just because somebody identifies with a party or not, you can't take just that piece of information and understand what they're going to do. Because the concept was developed by looking at Democrats who voted for 
for Dwight Eisenhower. So it doesn't necessarily, like vote choice is even something that's very different about this. Um, but what we can see is that when we look at the findings, it, it seems that in rural Alberta, that's the identity that gets activated. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why the elite messaging is the way that it is. The only thing I can say that makes the renewables moratorium make sense is when I've spoken to people who look at things like agricultural economics and they say the regulatory framework around oil and gas, access to mineral rights uh, and trampling over surface rights. I, rural folk, we, we have stories, we have stories. I understand these feelings well. It's still a, it's so much more of a robust framework than re renewables coming on. And so we had, like, so Lori, her family farms um, up by Grand Prairie. And so we would hear stories about people where the, and I don't think that they're true, but it's still the story that we would get, is that you would get a cash rent for $1,600 an acre per year to put a solar farm on. And I was like, why would anybody farm? And they're like, well, they could sell it for more. And I was just like, for 20 years? Absolutely not. No, no, I would be, you know, on some level, like farming is hard. You can get sick of it. I totally get it. Uh, so it's complicated. I guess that's the, one of the other things I would say is that none of this is very simple, but I, 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 there, that is in there. I think it works on this issue through partisanship. And I, we, we, we look for and we try to find and we don't see something separate about being rural that's powering through beyond that. So it, it's there and we know that it's there. This is blunt and so if it was strong enough to go through some of these other sorts of things and have an effect over and above them, that's what, we, what we're looking for to find. Yeah. Not sure if that makes sense, but. Yeah, my name is Mark Edel. So you're talking about your more expanded survey, including BC, Ontario, Quebec, and I believe New Brunswick. Could you? No. No. Okay, not New Brunswick. Okay. I, I, I okay. Okay. Him as my foil when okay. I talk about federalism. Being kind of uh, okay. New Brunswick agree with Alberta on this? No. no. So I'm just wondering, do you have uh, initial results, and can you give us a little sneak preview of, of what you're finding, and yeah. what are the wows that you're finding that we'd like to know? Um, so all of the anti-Indigenous stuff is from that national study. Uh, we find... <sighs> So I'm critical of ideas that say that region explains a lot in Canadian politics. In order for region to have the power that people assume that it does, uh, you'd have to be able to demonstrate that um, very different people live there. As in, you have a very different set of folks that live in Alberta compared to BC, compared to Ontario and Quebec. Quebec is easier because language, sure, but in terms of values and beliefs and things, all of the research from the 70s through to now shows that Canadians have broad consensus and any kinds of value and belief differences are like variations on a theme. The only profound disagreement is between Quebec and everybody else about how much should be done for Quebec, which is not surprising. But in terms of everything else, it's, it's, it's minor fluctuations. Uh, and so we can see then looking at the BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec stuff that Alberta like comes in at lower levels in terms of support for transition. And the partisan composition of Alberta is different, though not that different to big swaths of BC. Um, the Canadians are, it's the same story. Canadians are broadly supportive. Uh, lots of Canadians want this to be fast. Uh, when we asked, we asked this question about where do you want your electricity to come from, which is how we know that Albertans have no emotional connection to coal-fired electrification, and they're like, get it done. We are not, we were not surprised in 2019. If you had asked me to say, I wouldn't have thought that the government would have gone along with it, but at least in terms of public opinion, people were like, get us off coal as fast as possible, and we have beat our own targets on that. Uh, asking this in Quebec, where it's like 98% of your power comes from hydro, uh, what would you like it to be in 2030? They're like, hydro. <laughs> like, it's one of these things where it's, it's not a, as useful a question. Um, in some of this, we can see that, uh, like some people are viscerally opposed to solar. It's about 10% of participants. Um, the same proportion, about 10%, is viscerally opposed to nuclear. They're very different people, obviously. But, and it's that kind of like visceral opposition to solar that I find a bit, yeah. Th those are lists of things that we want to look at. Um, but we haven't seen much in when we expand it to those other provinces that 
leads us to tell a different story. What I think would lead us to tell a different story is how it changes over time. I, I don't think the politicization is neutral, and I think that is clarifying how on terms of partisan grounds, people are using that as their lens, and we're going to see some changes in overall levels of support there, but there isn't a strong regional story. But the grumpy political scientist in me is not at all surprised by that. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, in my background, I used to work in mining places, and many of them don't exist anymore. They're just a scar on the earth. The haul trucks up north in the oil sands are going autonomous. There's no driver. So I look at renewable energy being about 17% 17 of the mix right now. What are we doing for the people to transition all those people with good technical skills to get to this instead of leaving them left behind? Yeah. Uh, in other words, um, where are we at with the just transition? which is one of these things where I was just like, wow, so if we're just going to say that we're not going to do the just transition because it's an existential threat to oil and gas, what we're doing is basically saying we're not going to transition workers, which is not cool. Yeah. Um, I got to say, th those policies are outside of the scope of this project, but I do think that they're really important concerns that we have to keep front of mind because these are people's lives and livelihoods. And I think that there are lots of Albertans that are my age, especially men, who were sold this bill of goods that they uh, could go, they didn't have to finish high school, they didn't have to have educational credentials, they could go and drive, a, they could get a class one, that was what they needed, and then they would be able to make oodles and oodles of money. Um, only doing that kind of work. I have mature students who have come back as electricians out of the oil patch saying, you know, when they open up the tap for overtime, it's awesome, and then they cut it down to zero, and I'm just really sick of having it like, whoa, whoa. So they got a political science degree and went to law school, right? Like it's a, uh, And so in that sense, I think that I would connect it to things like uh, high fees for post-secondary education. There's going to be some training components. Some skills transfer, some won't. And so how are we making it easy? How are we supporting folks that might need to go and get different educational credentials? How are we supporting like the, the mental health effects for um, having to do some of these changes because they're hard? when you're not 18 anymore, right? Uh, and I, when I look at what Alberta's doing, I don't see a lot. Um, the federal government always has space to kind of like throw money at various sorts of things, but in, this is why this heavily politicized context about everything the federal government does in terms of spending in things that aren't like discreetly and pristinely listed in Section 91 of Constitution Act 1867. Like the feds could put money in that, and I'm pretty sure the provincial government would say, get off our lawn. Like, don't do that, which is, Quebec has done that forever, but um, I am dancing around this idea that, like, that transition is happening, people in the patch know it, and there isn't, I don't see the kinds of policy supports that I would expect um, that would actually take those folks in a kind way and do something with them. I can tell you, in terms of how post-secondary is being funded, that's not part of we were just being told to increase enrollment, but we're not being told to increase enrollment in any kind of strategic or careful way um, relating to that. There's strategy, but it's not related to that. Sorry, it's a very pessimistic answer, but. Thank you, Melanie, for your speech. It's been a long time ago that I first met. Anyway, my name is Everett Thomas. I'm a beneficiary of Treaty 7. And I mean, I've seen your sentence on the board there that for indigenous people to live, capitalism has to die. It reminded me of a few years ago when I told an indigenous young woman after her mother spoke at SAFPA, our economic values are based on fictional market values and could collapse any time. So I told her, you people have real values that will outlast ours. Now, coming back to this capitalism that has to die, it has to die for all of us. Because as long as we keep developing the planet only for money, we will destroy it. Thank you.
Yes. Anyway, to this, I would add two things. One is that um, Indigenous scholars have been pretty clear about how they would like things to change. Um, uh, I had the great privilege of working with Gina Star Blanket for a while at the UFC. She's currently um, running the, an international governance program at the University of Victoria. Um, outstanding scholar, absolutely brilliant. The punchline of a lot of her work is a, we signed treaties. I mean, if you know British Columbia at all, and when British Columbia joined Canada, they thought that the Royal Proclamation didn't apply to them, which is why the numbered treaties process didn't happen in BC. I don't know the. I, I don't know why um, that logic was applied. I mean, we have ideas. Anyway, when you live in a treaty context, what Indigenous folks are asking for is an actual reciprocal relationship, like that. And for settlers, that actually involves we would need to actually cede some power. Well, as in we wouldn't be able to be like, tell us what you think, and then we're going to totally ignore it and do what we want anyway. Like that. That's that's that. Can't, if you're in a good relationship with someone, you can't do it that way, right? And so the the, the solution I think is quite clear, um, and I think it actually is quite simple. And the people who are going to have to deal with the feelings about that changing are settlers. Um, uh, yeah, so there's that. Also, just as a teaser, John Locke, I just want to talk about how inconsistent the rationalization was. He was like, in England, we have to have the common land. And you know, I don't, I remember doing a country walk in England being like, I can walk through a farmer's field? This is so bizarre. Like, just finding it super disorienting. And his rationalization was, well, we have enough people, so the land is not empty. Uh, we have a system of government. And we have agreed to do money as an economy. And so that's why they can't enclose our land and take it away from us. Uh, but he says, but in North America, um, it's super empty, even though it wasn't. Like terra nullis is this idea that gets brought forward that is, we can empirically disconfirm it. People were here. Uh, and so he's just like, well, there's not a lot of people. And they really don't have government like we do government, even though there was a system of government. But it's just like, it's not like ours, so it doesn't count. And we've traded with them which means that they've basically agreed to do money. And because they've basically agreed to do money, but they don't have the stuff that we have that say that you can't enclose the land in England or take it away from the common people, we can just 100% unfettered to take the land here. I'm not a political philosopher because I find the nuances and the details um, and the weeds of these kinds of arguments frustrating. Um, and I stop at that argument because it's just like, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Like, you wrote it out in an inconsistent kind of way, and I don't think it worked then, and it really doesn't work now. But we don't talk about that stuff, right? I remember when I teach it, I was just like, think about it, think about it. Think about the sorts of things that we just don't even question, and it's all about the economy. And it's, I can tell when I've got a particular kind of student who suddenly is just like, oh, like the pennies drop. Anyway, I could go on at length. But I don't like John Locke. I think the argument is dumb. but. My name is Frances Schultz, and thank you so much, Melanie. But my question is, what's going to happen next? Because your research has taken place with the old UCP party. Now that it's been taken over by the Take Back Alberta group, what's going to happen between rural and uh, any of these opinions? Yeah. Uh, so the interesting thing about these data from 2019 is that uh, party identification is supposed to be something that's socialized in childhood, and so how do you do that when it's a new party? Which is why we talk about party families, right? Like the folks um, who were, not all of them, that were closely connected to the old PCAA, but like there's a, there's a reason why some folks are more, more receptive to the UCP even was first formed than not. Um, this is where it's not data from this project, uh, but like, I'm just going to, the spoiler alert, I, it's not a good story and I'm actually quite worried. Um, in 2018, we started doing the, um, the Road Ahead project through CBC Calgary. So again, academic advisor, uh, I would have designed the survey differently, but I wasn't paying for it, nor was I administering it. And I like really long, expensive surveys, and so I didn't get my way in lots of stuff. But what we did was we got enough information to talk about um, differences amongst Albertans in terms of like core values and beliefs. And in this we can see that there are 25, it's about four different groups in the population. 25% are dedicated lefties in terms of um, identifying on the political left, having consistent like left-leaning economic views and consistent left-leaning 
political views. You've got another 25% that's on the right, consistent in that direction. Um, we have this group where they, um, folks might call themselves red Tories, where they are socially progressive, but fiscally conservative, and they were conflicted. And they're just in this, in the 2018 context, they're just like, we don't know where to go. Because even then, they were looking at the UCP and being like, I have some hesitations. And then the part that worries me the most are the folks who were um, identifying on the political right, but really answered the economic questions in a manner that was more consistent with socialism than anything else. They would fundamentally reject that label. But it's paired with something I would call like social dominance orientation, where it's a um, society works better when um, like groups know their place. And so uh, this is the Coots crowd. And in 2018, they were not voters. They weren't activated. And I remember we looked at this and we're just kind of like, Bleh. like this is the, these are antecedents, attitudinal antecedents for lots of things that lead to not good actions. Like I'm not exaggerating when I say those are the ideas that you need in place as a step to engage in fascism. I'm not I'm not joking about that. And when I talk to people who like study things like radical right-wing movements and I tell them that, that's immediately where they go. So I'm, I'm not getting that from nowhere. And I'm not saying that everybody who's like in that space is, is in, pointed in that direction either. But it is one that is not necessarily consistent with um, the norms of democracy that we like, right? Or the norms of democracy that make democracies work well. And so in this, I think that I have the vote compass data from the 2023 election and I don't have time because I don't have grading support because post-secondary has been cut so badly. But like on my to-do list is to go through to see who those folks support because I asked for those questions to be included in the post-election survey for the most recent vote compass. And I'm willing to bet that they are now voters and they vote for Daniel Smith's UCP. And I think that lots of the elite messaging that I'm hearing is activating those groups. So all of this stuff with Preston Manning about um, who's responsible for um, health stuff. Anytime somebody talks about parental rights, like parental rights by our rights framework don't exist. Parents exercise rights on behalf of their kids who don't have the frontal lobe to be able to do it yet. But in terms of research ethics, we don't have to consider parents' preferences. We have to consider the rights of the participant who may be a child. And then we have to have an appropriate framework on that and we have rules about it. But this idea that just because somebody's a parent, they get to have a course of right over their kid, like that is fundamentally inconsistent with how we do rights. Um, and so when I, I just think about this context where there's, um, it's not, there's no fiscal conservatism there. Um, it is profoundly hierarchical in ways that many of us reject that are inconsistent with justice. Um, and so it can be seen as what's good for us is good for us and what's good for you is something that we don't care about, particularly because it might be seen as a zero sum. It's, it's grim. I'm depressing, I'm sorry, but it's, it's one of these things where I, I see it and we've seen it in enough other contexts where I, I worry about how it gets activated and what gets done with it and everything I'm seeing that I can attribute to that, I, or at least I have a reasonable hypothesis that I can attribute to that, makes me disquieted. No. What that means for energy transition, I don't know, other than they don't want to do it. Hi, I'm Tony Parnett, and thanks, Mel Melanie. It's very interesting data that you have. You've shown very clearly that most Albertans, even oil industry people, even rural people, intellectually or you know, at the level of the issue, are in favor of transition and want to move faster and so on, yet you've also said very clearly that the partisan consideration overwhelms everything else. Mm -hmm. And so all of these people who don't like the oil industry want to transition, especially in rural areas, they all flock to the polls or waded through the smoke and voted for the party that doesn't believe in climate change. So. I'm wondering, is there any way of breaking through that? Like uh, in, the, in the last election, the NDP chose basically to soft pedal, you know, not even mention climate change, um, basically line up with the oil industry narrative to, you know, not offend too many people. Um, and it didn't work, especially in the rural areas. Um, had, do you think it would have been any different if they had, you know, been brave enough to take on the need for transition fulsomely and advocate for change and, um, you know, renewables and, you know, project a lot of policy in that direction? 
Uh. Only in Alberta would a government party get that close to being uh, kicked out of office. Only in Alberta would the only reason why the incumbent party didn't get kicked out of office was because of how they noodled with the election map. Uh, only in Alberta would that be seen as anything other than a stinging condemnation of the party that was in power. As in, uh, the idea, how did Daniel Smith present it? It was a miracle on the prairies, it wasn't. It wasn't. The reason why you have that election going the way that it did is because whoever drew the map after the most, the 20, uh, after the most recent census, or the, the, when they drew the map 10 years ago, um, they did things like they split Medicine Hat into two districts by the river. And so instead of having an urban district um, where you could make a compelling case for a community of interest, which you need to do when you're drawing district boundaries in Canada, um, they made it so that it was the city gets split and it gets dwarfed by a rural area. And so I, in fairness, I was abroad for most of the provincial election and was kind of happy to be not in the midst of the dog and pony show. But I also know the research on voting behavior really well and can tell you that in order for a campaign to do anything for somebody's vote, they need to be genuinely undecided at the start of it. This is not what the data showed us about Alberta 2023. Most people had made up their minds. Um, most people, even if they were a bit soft, they had a pretty good idea of where they were gonna go, and in which case, if you know how you're voting before the campaign starts, the campaign actually doesn't move anything at the aggregate level. Um, and so in that sense, I think for some folks, it can be a really comforting story about like, if only we had campaigned in a different kind of way, it would have had a different outcome. And by we there, I mean you can swap any party that's kind of in that. I'm pretty sure, like the election strategy for not, um, for connecting to like transnational oil and gas stuff was designed by the NDP to make sure that they didn't lose um, a certain kind of urban Calgary voter. Because I think that they thought that those seats were going to be harder to get, but then they got a bunch of them, right? Uh, rural folks, uh, the partisanship is such that um, it's hard to break through that. and. The other thing I would say is that vote choice looks complicated. How people think and feel about things is really complicated. And people think and feel a lot of stuff that never touches the process that they use to determine how they vote in any given election. Uh, like, as in, every time a journalist is just like, what are the issues? I was like, all of them. It really depends on who you're talking to. It's noisy, it's super noisy. And so in that sense, I would look at, um, if I'm blaming the map, then the next question is watch how the map gets drawn because they have to redistrict now before the next election. And so it's just kind of like watch, watch that process. They should be appointing people like me as like the independent, like people that give them advice. Academics do this. Just watch. Watch to see who gets appointed to that. Yeah. So this is the end of a very uh, spirited question and answer period, but I'm going to ask Melanie to share a take-home message uh, for the audience. She's uh, had several there, but what is your final take-home message? Uh, on this issue, I, it's about core politics. It's not about how people think and feel about climate. You can't understand how this the politics of energy transition, it really is about the same core politics that it is about um, voting and a whole bunch of other issues. And so if we're only looking at how people think and feel about climate and climate related issues to try to explain this, we're missing most of the explanation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.